Hey there, this is your host, Dr. Lori Friesen, and you're listening to episode number 244 of Beginning Teacher Talk. Just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I'm dedicated to being the mentor for you that I wish I had when I first started teaching. In this podcast, we talk about all of the -the behind-the-scenes stuff about teaching you really need to know but didn't learn when you were in university. And we share the most amazing resources, tips, and strategies out there so you can become the teacher you've always dreamed of being. Let's start the show. Well, hey there, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. We are at episode number 244, and we are in part two of our new teacher spotlight series. And I have such a special treat for you today because I'm sharing an interview with you with one of my students. Her name is Rebecca Stafford. She goes by Becca in our Facebook group, and I originally aired this interview over a year ago on the podcast, but we have so many new listeners and what she had to say was so valuable and I think so inspiring and helpful for new teachers that I decided it would be wonderful to include a replay of her interview inside this spring series where we're sharing all the best tips for new teachers about how to prepare for the school year. So I'm trying to mix in some students that I've featured before as well as some new voices, some new teachers from this year. Now you might know Becca because she is a ready for school graduate. She served in the role of group expert in last summer's Facebook group for our Ready for School Academy students. We're going to be opening that group again this summer, by the way. So anybody who is a past student of the Academy is welcome to come join us. So if you're part of any of my groups, you'll know that one of the things I appreciate about Becca so much is her generous heart and her bright spirit. She responds so thoughtfully She's so generous in her willingness to share ideas and strategies that have worked in her classroom. I know you're going to enjoy getting to know Becca more in today's show as she shares her story of what her first year of teaching has been like. And I'm pretty sure that her experience is going to resonate with what you might be going through right now as you prepare for the school year. Now, if you're multitasking, please come back to me for just a moment because I really need your help. Here's why. If you're a longtime listener and you found this podcast to be valuable and helpful in your teaching life, and if you haven't left a written review for the podcast, I would be so super grateful if you would just take a few minutes to press pause and write a review for the podcast right now. Not only will you be entered into the draw to win a $25 Amazon gift card when you leave your raving review, but you will also be giving back. You'll be helping me to spread the word and support new teachers around the world. Your review matters. Your words matter your opinion matters. I read every single review that comes in for the podcast and it's only through reviews, not just my voice, but your voice that we can reach more teachers around the world and help more new teachers in countries around the world. So if you haven't left your review, please take a moment to do that right now. I'd be so grateful. Thank you so much. All right, my friends, let's dive in and welcome back into the show so you can hear about her experience as a first year teacher. Well, hey there, Becca. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you on as a guest today. (laughs) So please start by just telling us a little about you. I did brag about you a little bit in the introduction because I wanted everybody to know a little bit about you, but I'm so excited that you're here and I want my listeners to hear a little bit more about you. So my name is Rebecca Stafford. Um, I live in Chesapeake, Virginia, and I just finished Oh, it's been crazy. I just finished my um, very first year as a first grade teacher. And it was kind of like a a half year um, because I started, I did my student teaching in the fall. And then I started in January after winter break with my kids. So that, that was a whole challenge in its own, but (laughs) so you graduated in December and you already had a position lined up for January. That must've felt good. (laughs) Oh yeah. I, um, so while I was in my student teaching, um, I actually had two offers for two different schools, the school I was student teaching at and the school that was in my neighborhood, both for first grade. Um, and I ended up going with the one that was right in my neighborhood. Cause it's about a 30 second commute. So, <laughs> um, it was great. I'm, I was so excited and I, I knew that I had the position like about two weeks before my student teaching ended. So I was able to, you know, start getting on a roll and I had winter break and everything. So it was, 
So were you student teaching in first grade as well? Did you get to stay in the same grade? I was student teaching in kindergarten. So okay. I, I had that primary experience, but yeah. um, I originally wanted to teach upper elementary, like third grade. So um, first grade, I'm, I'm really glad that I had that experience in kindergarten because I would have been yes. lost <laughs> going. No, it's, first. it's so cool that you say that because I always think all of us should have a year in kindergarten, even though it's literally probably the hardest grade to teach in many ways, because they are brand new at everything. Like this is school, like it's everything's brand new, but it also helps us to understand the building blocks of language and how students start coming to understand text and how they understand what letters are and what sounds letters make. Like we really go down to the basics. And once you've taught at that level, I mean, for you moving up to first grade, you must've been like, wow, I can't believe how much they know. Like they can do so much in first grade. <laughs> Whereas yes. if you're coming down from like through yes. first grade, yeah, yes, that's when the magic happens. Now that you've taught for a whole year, it's like they come back after the Christmas break. I don't know if you call it Christmas break where you are, but winter break. And right after that, it's like things all start coming together and they actually start reading sentences, which is amazing at, at second half of first grade. So the magic starts happening there. So that's really exciting. I, you're like me. I actually thought I was going to be teaching when I first graduated, I wanted to teach high school English, but I, there was no jobs available in high school English. So I ended up in fourth grade first and then down to second. And I was terrified, but I ended up loving second grade. It was like one of my favorite grades. So I'm curious, you already had, you had been student teaching in kindergarten, and then you were offered a first grade position in first, in first grade right before the end of that. So why did you decide to join the academy? So um, I joined the academy actually before I started student teaching. And I have to say that I almost didn't because mm -hmm. um, I just... I still had my student teaching to do. I yeah. didn't have a job offer at the time. Um, I didn't know, I knew what grade I wanted to teach, but I didn't know what grade I was going to teach. So I was just, it was really hard for me to justify spending yes. that money. Um, yeah. But I just, I decided to take the leap because I wanted to be more prepared and organized. I knew that I was going to be in a classroom at some yep. point and I wanted to be ready and not, you know, kind of scrambling last minute. So I had a lot of ideas from my kindergarten classroom about, you know, different, um, in my student teaching about different, um, like classroom management things I wanted to do and different procedures and routines. But I just, I really wanted to have kind of someone help me think through all those little things that yes. I, I, I knew I wasn't thinking about. I knew that I was going to forget something. And I just, I, I didn't want to be scrambling last minute. <laughs> it's kind of amazing how many things there are to think about when you're preparing to set up and decorate your first classroom, because like I, we talked a little bit about this before we started uh, our interview today, but that you're living at home right now. I was living at home when I first started teaching too, and I had never decorated my own apartment. Like I'd never had to decorate my own space. And now you're all of a sudden responsible for decorating an entire classroom. And not just that, like, not just for you, but for 25 kids, right? And you have to organize it all and all of the things. So it can feel overwhelming, especially when you have so many options. So I know you've gone with the farmhouse chic uh, decor in your classroom, right? Probably one of my yes. favorite themes Oh ever. my gosh. And I, you know, even before I took the Academy, I knew I wanted to do some, a theme like that for my classroom. So mm -hmm. as soon as I got in and I realized, oh my gosh, there's all of this stuff in this theme that I wanted. I was so excited. <laughs> and the best part is like you were mentioning, you've done all the work now you're changing classrooms. And I'm like, don't redo it. Like find a way. Cause the carpet doesn't quite go with your farmhouse chic. Right. And I'm like, okay, find a new carpet or find a way to make the carpet work with your theme, <laughs> because it is, it's a tremendous amount of work to do it the first time. But now that you're moving classrooms and you have it all, use it again, like keep using the same theme because, and it's kind of cool. A lot of people think, oh, you can't use, you have to use bright colors in lower elementary. I love farmhouse chic in first grade and kindergarten. I think it's really beautiful and soft. So um, I think it's going to be beautiful in your classroom. I don't know what you're going to do, but I hope you decide don't, don't take on too much work. If you don't have to, if you can use it again, use it again. But even if you do decide to change themes a little bit or switch things up a bit, you at least have the roadmap and you know, kind of like, here's the checklist of things I'd have to do if I decide I want to redo it or do something different. So 
I, I totally understand the work that it takes, but once you've done it once, holy cow, so much easier after that. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I love the farmhouse sheet cause it's so calming and, you know, I love, especially in primary grades, you know, they like colorful and lots of yes. things, but I, I just, I didn't want it to be too overstimulating for them. And I just, yeah. I love green. I love calm. I love, um, yeah. just that kind of atmosphere. So I think I'm going to stick with it and we're just, I'm just going to make it work, especially because yeah. I have everything made already. <laughs> yeah. And you can add brighter colors behind it too, or use different accent colors because it's mostly gray. So you should be okay with that. And it was interesting. I, I, when I was listening to you talk about being a student teacher, I bet a lot of teachers are nodding their heads when you started talking about the cost, because I remember what it was like to be a student teacher and feeling like I don't have a job yet. I don't know if I am even going to have an income, but one of the things I love sharing with teachers, and I'm glad you mentioned it was that when you purchase the Academy before you're finished, your student teaching, not only do you in my experience, I would have assumed I would have a lot more experience in terms of knowing what to ask my mentor teacher and really paying attention to how they're doing things in their classroom. So you can make really informed decisions about, well, how do I want to do it? You can ask those questions. How did they set up their classroom and why? How did you organize your library and why? How did you decide on your classroom management plan and why? So that when you go ahead and now are going to make your own classroom or create your own. It makes it so much easier to make those decisions and make informed decisions about why you're doing the things you want and make that transition easier. Like it was for you, you had that whole winter break to do the work because you knew what you needed to do. So I loved hearing that. So what were you really struggling with and what were you really trying to figure out on your own before you took the academy? So one of my biggest things, and especially not knowing what my classroom was going to look like, yeah. um, was how I was going to set everything up. I knew I wanted to have, you know, mailboxes. I knew I wanted to have all of these things, mm -hmm. but I just, I wanted to make sure that my room flowed uh, because yes. being, I subbed before I did my student teaching and being in so many classrooms, I've seen some classrooms that didn't quite <laughs> <laughs> Hello. It was kind of, you know, you came in the door and you were bombarded and it just, so I wanted to make sure um, that I had a good idea of where everything should go, what the best fit for it was. So that's kind of something that I was struggling with before. Um, yeah. And then how to set up my library. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I, I originally wanted to set it up by reading level, but then I realized I'm going to have to have a lot of leveled books for my first graders and in yep. first grade, you know, they, they love looking at the pictures and making up their own stories in their head too. So yep. um, those are definitely some things that I was struggling with before. Yeah. And it always amazes me how we can spend four years in college learning how to teach, but we don't have time somehow to cover such practical topics like, you know, how to set up your classroom library and how to create a flow in your classroom. Because the, and the longer I work with new teachers, especially the more I realize there's such a gap between what we learned in college and what we actually need to know how to implement everything we learned in college. And oh yeah, I, all of my courses, I mean, I, yeah. my program was great. I learned so yeah. much um, from my university, mm -hmm. um, but it's just, it's so different, even from student teaching, being in your own classroom and having all of these things that you need to think about. It's just, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, Taking the reins on your own is kind of the hardest part, right? Like it's, it's easy to say, well, when I have my classroom, I'm going to, but then once it's actually your own classroom, mm -hmm. you're like, wait, wait, how do I actually, <laughs> how do I do yes. all of this? <laughs> I'm laughing. Cause that's, that's exactly, exactly how it happens. <laughs> yeah. And I know, cause I also graduated from the university of Lethbridge in Canada, which is probably one of the premier teaching universities in all of Canada. It's a great university. I don't fault them at all, but there's only so much you can cram into four years. And there's so much about learning to be a teacher that you know, you just can't cover. So um, I'm glad that you're talking about that because these are the very practical things that we just aren't taught. We don't have time to learn. So how did you feel once you completed the course? What did you feel like you had more control over? Well, I definitely feel like I had more control over my classroom management. I just, like I said, I had so many um, ideas for things that I wanted to try. Um, mm -hmm. And I got so many more ideas from the academy. And right. um, once I actually got in there, you know, it was kind of a learning curve because I 
put all of these things into place that I really wanted to do. And then um, I realized quickly that some things just don't work with some groups of kids and it didn't work with me. It wasn't things that I could keep up with. And so having all of those different tools and tips and tricks at my disposal, I was able to just kind of pick and choose, okay, I need to try something new. What else can I try? And I had that available. So I felt like I wasn't scrambling for trying to figure out what to do. It was yes. just, okay, now I have this, I can do that instead of figuring out, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even have any options. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, that's such a good point. Cause I think one of the hardest parts about classroom management is a, we feel like we have to go into our classrooms knowing how everything's going to work perfectly. And then we meet the kids and we're like, wait a minute, I did not expect that this was going to happen and this was going to happen. And so it's a learning experience. You end up changing things up as you go, because the kids don't respond the way you thought they would. It's like you said, harder for you to implement than you thought it might be, or it just isn't meshing with your teaching style. And so it's nice to be able to go back to basics when I teach you in the academy and go, okay, what else would be a strategy? What else would be something like, how else could I think about this? And that is probably something that I wish so many other new teachers had, because if there's one thing that comes up over and over again in our Facebook groups, it's classroom management and the empowerment that so many new teachers feel once they've completed the academy is from mostly not all, but a lot of it is classroom management. Cause you feel like, okay, I have a handle on this. I know what I should be doing, what I could be doing. And you have options, which you didn't have before. Yeah. And focusing on the positive too, that was something yes. that you had mentioned plenty in the academy yeah. and in your podcast. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I knew, of course I wanted to focus on the positive, but sometimes it's Yep. It's tricky, especially when you have those challenging behaviors. And I had mm-hmm. one or two this year with some challenging behaviors and, yep. um, it just, it's, um, <clears throat> it's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And they teach us a lot about being a teacher. And that's why actually you're mentioning this. I'm really glad you are, because I think one of the things that was hardest for me when I first started teaching was understanding how to implement natural consequences consistently, because of course we want to focus on the positive. Of course we do. But also there are natural consequences when you choose not to follow the rules. So I still love you. I still appreciate you. You're still an amazing little human being, but also this is the way things run in our classroom. And if you can't follow the rules, this is what's going to happen. And so I think just having those natural consequences is so valuable, but it's hard to think on our feet. And so that's why this year I added, I think it's 19 natural consequences you can use in your classroom for very common behaviors that happen because I don't know if you're like this, but for me, it was really hard to think on my feet to think about, okay, what is the natural consequence here? What could I use? They don't always work. There is no natural consequence for everything because classrooms are an artificial environment, right? We can't apply it for everything, but it sure helps with being consistent in terms of figuring out ways when you can't just focus on the positive, when you need to correct behavior, which we absolutely do need to do, those can be so helpful. So I hope those are going to be helpful for you as well. I added those this year. So which areas did you feel more prepared for when you completed the academy? We've talked about classroom management, but anything a little more specific? Yeah, so definitely um, teaching my routines and procedures. Like I said, I knew what I wanted to do for my routines and procedures and how I wanted, you know, my kids to do these things and go about their day. But I never... I never knew how to teach them that, like, how do, how do I expect them to know how to do these things (laughs) that I want them to do? And so like that I do, we do, you do model and, um, you know, using the, the games in the beginning of the year to help review. I, I loved that. And that definitely helps me feel more prepared in teaching them next year too. Yeah. It's so interesting because we think we teach every, we teach so many different other things in our classroom. Like we are comfortable with teaching content, but when it comes to teaching them how our classroom is going to work, the reason we usually don't teach that well is because we don't really know yet. Like, and that's what I think is the biggest stumbling block. But when I walk you through and say, okay, here's, here are the routines you need to create. Here are the things you need to get clear about first before you can teach them. It's like, oh, wait, that foundational piece is something that we skip over too often. We don't actually think through how are we going to 
expect them? What are we going to expect them to do? And then second part, like you mentioned, how do we actually teach that? So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, And then um, also the like meet the teacher night open, we call it open house. Um, But it's just, I, I didn't get to really have one of those coming in midway. We did a virtual one that was kind of like a a little meet and greet um, where I just talked about, you know, our classroom for a little Mm -hmm. bit, but next year, I feel like they're going to bring back the in-person open house. So Um, so I, (laughs) I'm going to get a chance to implement those things that I learned in the Academy. And I, there's so many great things in there and like the volunteers um, to sign up for. So I'm, I'm very excited and I feel more prepared for that next year. (laughs) You know what? I used to hate meet the teacher night. I hated it because I didn't know what to cover and I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And I peek into other teachers' classrooms and be like, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, what am I? But once I actually started figuring this out, it became one of my favorite nights of the year because I knew I was going to, first of all, make a great first impression. Cause like I teach you, this is how you show them that you know what you're doing by actually knowing what you're doing, right? Like they'll feel your energy when you show up and you go, all right, here's how volunteers are going to run in our classroom. Here's what my homework policy is. Here's how I'm handling misbehaviors. Here's how I'm communicating with you positively. Here's all of the things that you've thought through in advance and are now communicating to them on Meet the Teacher Night. It's a game changer because you gain immediate respect when you do actually know what you're doing. You do. You know what you're doing. I mean, you've literally thought it all through and now you've set up your own systems using mine as a model, totally adapt and change it to however it's going to work for you. But now you've set up your own system for this is how parents are going to be involved in my classroom. Here's what I'm comfortable with. Here's what I'm not comfortable with. And here's what happens. One of my favorite things about Meet the Teacher Night is teaching parents what will happen when they show up unannounced in my classroom. I don't know if you've had any parents like that, but I taught at a school where I had a lot of, at first, I mean, our our community changed over the years, but in the beginning, we had a lot of dentists and doctors, families, and are like kind of very affluent and the wives didn't work. So they would just like to pop in throughout the day and just hang out. And I'm like, this is actually not your social setting. Like this is actually, we're doing work here. And so I learned to set up this parent volunteer station in my classroom. And I taught them that when the moment you come into our classroom, we're so thrilled to have you, here's what I want you to do. And it was all set up for them. So they knew the moment they came in, I'd welcome them and say, kids, great, awesome. Mrs. So-and-so is here. She's going to be helping us today. She knows exactly what to do. And they and the parent was always like, oh my gosh. Okay. Like I actually have to do some work here, <laughs> but yeah, cause yeah. I expect them to model that for the kids. We're all working. And so of course you will be too. So anyway, I'm so glad you said that. Cause you will feel so much more confident when you walk into that meeting or that night and feeling like, you know what you're doing. So what was your biggest aha moment when you took the Academy? I'm always curious. Um, so I, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but just realizing that it's okay to switch things up when they're not working. I, you know, I, through yes. subbing and student teaching and, you know, looking on Pinterest, we all do it. Yep. Um, I had these very specific ideas in my head. This is exactly what I want to do. This is yep. how my classroom is going to run. And you get in that classroom. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's just not at all how you plan for it to be. And right. it's, it's just, it's so important to be flexible. And I learned this through the Academy. And I also learned it when I was in my own classroom and from my amazing first year teacher mentor that I had, Aww. you just, um, you have to adapt and you have to go with the flow. If something's not working, why are you going to keep doing it? You, yes. you have to switch it up and don't be afraid to change things and try new things. And if that thing doesn't work, try something else. You know, you just have to keep it's trial and error until you figure out something that works for you and works for your kids. Yes. I love that you said that because like we said, you said we go onto social media and it's not real. I mean, you're only seeing other people's (laughs) highlight reels. So maybe some of the things that they're talking about really did work that way, but more often than not, there were a lot of things that happened behind the scenes that probably they don't want to share uh-huh. on social media, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so it is true. Like you have ideas in your head. It's kind of like for anyone who hasn't had kids yet, I was like, I am going to be such a great parent when I'm a parent, I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> and then you meet your kids and it's like, wait a minute, 
Um, <laughs> they have a whole other things change. You just can't do things the way you imagined in your perfect world. So I love that you said that about being flexible and responding to what's happening in your classroom and changing based on what is working and doing more of what's working instead of trying to force something an idea that you thought might have been the way it was going to work. So, and I also love that you gave yourself permission to experiment, that you had that mentor teacher who was supporting you in that and saying, look it, if it's not working, stop banging your head against the wall or it's going to keep hurting, right? Like <laughs> we keep doing that. We keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result and it doesn't work. So I love that you had that um, mentor and that you allowed yourself to hold it all a little more lightly and to not take it quite as seriously. Cause I think we go into our classrooms with this expectation that we have to be perfect, that everything has to work out perfectly in the beginning. And the reality is nothing about teaching is perfect and nothing about being human is perfect. And your kids are going to mess up and you're going to mess up. And once we are more comfortable with allowing ourselves to get away from that idea of the best way of doing things and instead think about it's just a different way. I'm going to experiment with something different and put on that. I like to talk about the mad hatters. Is it called the mad hatter or the like just experimenting with whatever it is that you're going to be doing in your classroom and not staying so committed to the idea if it's not working. Yeah. So. And being flexible year to year too. I mean, each yes. class is not going to look the same from one year to the next. What worked for me this yep. year with my kids may be completely opposite <laughs> next year. One when kid I get can my throw it off, right? Like one yeah. student, <laughs> you have yeah. a new student. It's like, wait a minute, that was working. But now that this child has entered my world, oh my gosh, things are different. So tell me what was your favorite lesson inside the academy? What was kind of your one moment when you went, this is really important to me. Um, well, like I mentioned before with the routines and procedures, that one lesson in the academy, it just, it helped me so much, um, you know, okay, knowing good. that um, different ways for how to teach those routines and procedures, because mm -hmm. that's something that I was really struggling with. And I also um, really loved the, which I think is probably anyone who's been through the academy already will probably have loved this one. The one where you talk about a touch of magic in your classroom and yes. um, just so fun. Yes. Just finding things that are going to make learning and behaving <laughs> fun for your yes. kids. And I just, I love it. And for you, I mean, because I think what kids love the most at the end of the day, you might have a beautiful farmhouse chic classroom, but wait, what they love the most about your classroom is you. Like they really want to get to know you. And inside the academy, I teach this lesson about adding your own touch of magic and whatever it is that you love finding a way to bring that into your classroom management and finding a way to bring that into your classroom on a daily basis and weaving it into the experiences with your students. That was one of my favorite parts of teaching because I got to share me with them and use it also as a classroom management tool. If you're not in the academy, this might not make any sense to you at all, but <laughs> it, it was, it's something that we'd have to do a whole separate podcast on, but it is something that I really encourage you to do, to think about, even if you're not an academy member, to think about how can you infuse a little more of you into your classroom and into the way you do things inside your classroom, because that's invaluable for your students. They're going to remember you years later, probably not too much else, but they'll remember you. So what would you say to someone who is on the fence about joining the Academy, Becca? Oh my gosh. I would definitely tell you to take the leap. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here on Lori's podcast, with her, <laughs> but it just, I was so hesitant about it. And yeah. thinking back, I think about where I, how it could have gone if I didn't take, if I didn't, you know, enroll in the Academy and um, go through the process and, it would have, I mean, I have a great, I had a wonderful mentor and I'm sure she mm -hmm. would have helped me tremendously yes. um, with everything that the academy went over to, but just being able to prepare before I even got in the classroom and being able to think through all of those things, um, even though I still have my student teaching to do, even though I didn't know what grade I was going to be in, I didn't have a job offer. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it was so beneficial to be able to think through those things beforehand and prepare. And it really helped me feel more confident going into my first year when I did get that offer. And I accepted the position. I was like, okay, I know where to start. I know what I'm doing. I have mm -hmm. a foot to stand on. Um, and it helped me in my interview too. Um, uh -huh. having 
think thought through my classroom management plan, I I have no doubt that that helped because I yes. think some of the responses that I was giving was from what I learned in the academy. And um, so even if you don't have a job offer yet, it could be really beneficial in the interview process to go through the academy. And then it's kind of like a plus too, because you you have this for your interview, but then once you get the position, the job, the classroom, you've already thought through this already. So it's kind of like a, um, two, one bird with two stones, two birds with one stone. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We get what you mean. It, (laughs) I love that you said that about that, because so often when we're interviewing, we get tripped up on those kinds of questions during interviews, because we feel like we don't have enough experience to answer questions about classroom management, about data tracking. But when you've gone through the academy, like you mentioned, and you have a better understanding of how you're, it makes it more real because you're, you know, how you're planning. It's not just an, an assignment anymore. It's not just something that you think you might do. It's literally thinking through I'm going to actually have to do this now. So you're actually implementing what you've learned in the academy and hopefully what you've learned in college when you can speak about how this is going to work in your classroom with with as much confidence as you can muster because you haven't done it yet, but you have the classroom management plan. You are light years ahead of so many other new teachers and it can really help you to stand out during interviews because you've thought that through and you've created that plan for how you'll manage your classroom. And I also loved what you said about your mentor teacher. I hope everybody has a fantastic mentor teacher their first year because it's such a blessing. But I also understand I had I had kind of a good, me- I had a very mixed experience, but we won't get into that. Um, but what's challenging is even when you have a great mentor teacher, they're busy too. And as big hearted as they are. And as much as they want to help you, I felt sometimes like I felt bad asking for time too often because I knew how busy they were. So sometimes, I mean, obviously if I had a rough day, I would go into her classroom and ball my eyes out and, you know, she was there to help me. <laughs> but for the most part, like I had to figure some stuff out because she was busy. I mean, she was teaching her own classroom. So I love that you mentioned that um, about your mentor teacher and also to give yourself that kind of confidence when she's not around to solve your own problems, you can use what you learn inside the academy. So, so good. Becca, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. And for everyone who's listening, be sure to connect with Becca. She's inside our Facebook groups. She helps me to support all of our communities. So thanks again, Becca. So happy and so thrilled to have had you on today. Thank you for having me. I love it. Like I mentioned earlier, it's just, it's, it's so cool being on here and talking to you and talking to everybody. It's just, it's amazing. So thank you. So glad you could come. Thanks again. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Becca as much as I did. And if you're thinking about joining the Academy, come join me for my free live workshop, Four Proven Steps to Set Up and Organize Your Classroom and Create a Classroom Management Plan that Actually Works. So you can finally feel confident and truly prepared for that first day and that first week of school without wasting time or missing anything important. And I'm going to tell you more about how you can enroll in Ready for School Academy towards the end of that free masterclass. How would it feel to know the four proven steps that you can take immediately to prepare for the school year, even if you haven't secured a contract, even if you don't know what grade you're going to be teaching or have seen your classroom? It's possible. How would it feel to have a clear step-by-step plan to set up and organize your classroom, including your classroom library, and create a simple proven classroom management plan and prevent challenges with the most difficult students? And you're going to walk away from the workshop with a streamlined plan to prepare for that first day of school, and five classroom-tested activities to build community and develop genuine relationships with your students. If all that sounds amazing to you, reserve your seat for my free live workshop by going to drlauriefriesen.com forward slash masterclass. We'll link to that for you in the show notes. I can't wait to see you there so we can up-level your confidence and help you get this all done in advance so you can actually enjoy the rest of your summer. So if you haven't watched that masterclass yet, I invite you to join us. If you have watched it, come join us again, because it's a totally different experience when it's live. It's so much fun. Again, it'll be the first week of June. And we're going to also attach, if you become an Academy member, a free Facebook group for the summer that you can be part of as an Academy member. If you've joined in the several years before, you get to be part of that Facebook group as well. All right, my friends, I hope you have a wonderful week. And until next time, as always, remember, just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there's no need for you to struggle like one. Bye for now.